Welcome to the Life Writing Podcast, where married authors and screenwriters Stephen Barnes and Tanana Reeve do talk about writing during stressful times, breaking into Hollywood and balancing life. Every week, every week, and every week, we're going to share more tips on how to build a better life while you create your dream projects. Even if it's only at the rate of a sentence a day, life writing is the application of the tools of writing to life and the tools of life to your writing. So yay, here we are back back in the saddle again. Um, I am still floating from, from last week's podcast that we did oh. with Octavia Butler. Uh, I mean, it wasn't with her, but it was with her recording and asking questions as if she were a guest almost and her answers about her own struggles as a writer, um, her outlook on humanity, all of it is just, uh, it was so good. In fact, if you haven't listened to that, I'm not saying don't listen to this, but after you finish listening to this, go back to last week and do not miss that Octavia Butler episode. It was so good. Absolutely. I had the the pleasure of having hundreds of hours of conversation with Octavia, um, talking about life and writing and politics and other things. So I wish I had more of those conversations to share, but at least we have some of them. Yes. And the one that we that we were able to capture and share, that, that was good stuff. You were asking really great questions. I think I was asking pretty decent questions. And Octavia was in a very great mood to be able to answer them. I mean, she was at a point in her life right then when she knew that she was seen. Yes. You know, they, she had, she, people understood what she was trying to do and appreciated what she was trying to do. And that is so important for an artist. You know, I think that people have have mistaken ideas about what the artistic life is. Uh, they think it's either, you know, just tapping on your computer when the, the muse strikes you, or they think it is, you know, an endless suffering. And neither of those things are true. It's a combination of moments of joy and moments of effort. And, and most of the, of the suffering, I think, is... Well, most of human suffering, the Buddhists would say, is self-imposed. It, it's not living up to our own expectations. It's taking people's criticisms to heart. It's not being where we thought we'd be at a particular point in our careers. That stuff is, is heady. I mean, it's, it's, it can be painful, but I think you can manage that stuff. You, can man you can't manage how the world is going to treat your writing, but you can manage how you react to the way the world is treating you. And speaking of the mood she was in at that point, I mean, she had suffered the loss of her mother by the, by the time we did that interview and she had moved up to the Seattle area, but there was the financial piece. I think for the first time, she really had a solid financial base under her feet because she had won the MacArthur Genius Grant. Yes. And so she bought a house. Really, it felt like she was living her best life up there. So, I mean, I think that that if you are interested in the, I think one of the reasons why parents will often discourage their children from going into the arts is because it is difficult to make a living doing that. And, and a lot of what your parents are worried about is, you know, will you be able to hunt and gather for yourself? You know, are you going to be able to leave the nest? Are you going to be able to, to function in the world and have your own family? In other words, are you going to be an adult like them? I think that's the primary thing that, that we do as parents parents is try to prepare our children to replace us in the world that yes <laughs> being adults and i think that if you start with that one of the things that is not discussed in masters of fine arts programs and the like is the financial component both how to market your work let alone how to budget money and things like that but those are the kinds of things that we hope to be able to discuss how do you protect yourself how do you create a safe nest for yourself? How do you sustain the work over years and decades before people acknowledge you? I mean, because Octavia was, you know, labored in, in virtual anonymity for decades. I, well, as artists, you know, I always think about that scene in Spike Lee's Crooklyn, right? I think Delroy Lindo played his father, who was a jazz musician. And there's that moment where he's sitting at the piano, feeling uh, unappreciated, of course, by the world, tinkling away on the piano keys while the lights are going out right and that could be so many 
artists, we've had financial struggles. Um, I know our guest probably wouldn't mind me saying that she has had financial struggles. Octavia obviously had a financial struggles. So this is a this is an important piece and an important conversation is finding that safe space from which to create. You know, for me, creativity is just creating a conscious link between your dreaming space and your fingers. You know, just to, so that you can you can work. And and what gets in the way is the doubt and the fear, uh, the, the the imposter syndrome voices in your head, all that emotional stuff. Assuming that none of that stuff was there, we could write all day long. Most of it would be garbage. But the truth is that if you can get past the first draft phase, if you've got those negative voices, um, you, for instance, are very, very well integrated in the sense that your first drafts, you, 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 tr you can trust them enough that if you keep working on them until they're polished, you can move on to the next page, the next chapter, and you've never had to go back and do massive amounts of rewriting. I think that is because you actually have an internal emotional, mental construction that allows you to do that. You don't have, you have permission to succeed <laughs> in, well. in, in ways that a lot of people do not, especially when it comes to artistic work. You know, your, your, your mom gave you permission to do that, to go out in the world. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the hope and dream of the slave, um, the, 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 the heirs to the sacrifices of the civil rights movement, you know, all of that mindset was a part of our household, not just sort of in an implied way, but pretty much a stated way. My sure. mother said, "You, I went to jail so you wouldn't have to, is what she told me. Yeah, and once you had a career, you clearly could have made a career and you had made a career in uh, journalism. And once you had that foundation you then could experiment with writing books and fiction. And if that's oh, yes. off, then you still have this thing you can fall back to. Now your fallback position is teaching. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes. you've got that, and that allows you to feel free. The, the, the kid part of yourself, the dreamer part of yourself, is protected by the adult part of yourself that is bringing in enough money from your teaching to support a normal family, to support a, norm, a normal person. So... If you don't have that, if you're constantly struggling with with fear of of homelessness, of, of your lights not being on, not being able to take care of your kids if you have a family, that stress then erodes your health. It, it, mm -hmm. it cuts your immune system. It you know your own your own tissues get devoured by your immune system if you're constantly under stress. So this stuff then has physiological impact, not just emotional on your relationships or on your ability to create. So what we're trying to do, if, if, if we're looking at the, at the hero's journey and the road of trials is what you have to do between where you are and where you can get to where your work is appreciated and honored and remunerated, then understand that, that the pain, the fear, the uncertainty, these are the demons, the ghosts that are going to haunt you as you walk that path. And it is critical, I think it's very, very important, if not critical, to understand that before you begin the journey or before you continue the journey. So you're saying, I'm going to run into these problems. What resources will I need, do I have to be able to do that. And the Life Writing Podcast is really trying to help people with those resources. Community, that's the word I was thinking of. So oh, yeah. Nalo has been, our guest today, Nalo Hopkinson has been part of our community for years yes. and, and Octavia's community before Octavia passed away. She, Nalo might have been the first other black science fiction fantasy writer that began to gain real note um, that Octavia and I were noticing were, were, was publishing and publishing work that spoke to her culture and ethnicity. Um, so I, I think that she's she's more important in that sense than I think a lot of people realize. I think that she was one of the people where you know Octavia and I were kind of saying, "Wow, it's it's finally happening. We're getting some we're getting some traction. Some other people are coming in, and Nalo is is great." You know. So this was I really it was so lonely during that period when we were the only ones that that Nalo's skill and presence had more impact than it would have had had this had the 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 community been larger when she came into it 
Shall I introduce our guest? Yeah, yeah, I would appreciate that very much. Let's do it because this is incredible. In 2021, Nalo Hopkinson was awarded the Damon Knight Memorial Grandmaster Award. So she is joining the Grandmaster ranks along and has rather joined the Grandmaster ranks alongside such a legends as Ursula K. Le Guin, Ray Bradbury, and Joe Haldeman. And this was at the Nebula Awards held in 2021. Her first novel, Brown Girl in the Ring, was published as the winner of the Warner Aspect First Novel Contest in 1998, won a John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer, Locus Award for Best New First Novel, right out of the gate. She's published five additional novels, if this is still correct, including the Andre, and including the Andre Norton Award winning Sister Mine, and three collections of her short fiction. She's also an editor guest editing an issue of Lightspeed Magazine, editing five anthologies. I know I was included in one, including Whispers from the Cotton Tree Root, uh, Caribbean Fabulous Fiction, and So Long Been Dreaming, Post-Colonial Science Fiction and Fantasy. She's also won the British Fantasy Award, the Aurora Award, the Galactic Spectrum Award, the Sunburst Award. She's taught at Clarion East, Clarion West, Clarion South. <laughs> And she's also teaching, she's a professor. She's going to have to say where she's teaching because she has a new job that's not in this bio. <laughs> but without further ado, the great Nalo Kinsey. Join us. Woo, Nalo. How about that? You didn't know we had a studio audience, did you? I, I did not. No, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a sound effects bank. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I, know. I, I live with a person who does video editing I recognize the sound okay I'm just kidding so tell me where you are teaching now because it flew out of my head just when I was introducing you yeah, where you're teaching and in, in how is life uh, I am at the University of British Columbia UBC which is in Vancouver uh, Canada uh, I just I'm just finishing up my first term of teaching I started in the summer but they gave me some time to actually you know try and get moved in and figure out where my books are and that kind of thing um Life is good. It's sometimes hard to recognize that, but life is pretty good. Uh, Talk about that a little bit, would you please? Yeah, I mean, about, like resting in the is, moment. It's good, but it's hard to recognize that. Yeah, because I think you always have those things you're striving for that you haven't gotten to yet, so you can get mired in this dissatisfaction. So every so often, you just got to. Me and my my sweetie just got to sit and look at each other and go, "Well, look at all this good stuff that's happening." Yes. Uh, and recognize that we are in a good place. It's also, I guess, partly being an artist, even though I now have a, a, a permanent job, you're never really sure things are going to stay good. Yes. There's always that uncertainty of, well, but what if, but what if? Um, but that's not a really productive place to get mired in. No place is productive to get mired in. I mean, it's like, <laughs> that, you know, it, I know too many artists who become depressive as a result of rejection or their imposter voices. Yeah. I'm sure you're unfamiliar with that concept. <laughs> Strangely, not as a writer. As a professor, yeah, lots of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, as a writer, no. Um, and I think. Part of it is that that is is my training is is I come from a family of makers of things and my dad was a writer and a performer and um, so people around us were writers and artists. I think I felt like that's a place I could be. Professors, hmm, not so much. And I don't have the sort of I didn't go through academe to become a professor. I uh, I was already on my third published novel when I took my first MA and it. It wasn't about trying to learn to become a writer. Uh, it was about getting mentored through that very difficult novel. Mm. So I don't have that that sort of professorial training that I don't know if that would give me more of a sense of I belong here, but I recognize that imposter syndrome happens to the people who are actually doing the work. <laughs> I'm only Nalo, I am laughing. I'm not going to go into details, but let's just say I understand exactly what you're talking about. I too am an artist who came into teaching from the outside. I did not come up through a PhD program by any stretch. <laughs> so, you know, even the language of academia is a mystery to me at times, you know, and, and I, I'm not going to say any more about it, but I absolutely feel you on that. And 
you know, one of the things about staying present in the moment and realizing, oh, okay, things are good right now is comparing where you were, you know, 10 years ago, yeah. 10 years ago, how different was life for you? Uh -huh. 10 years ago, I was just coming out of two years of being homeless. Um, those were two very, very rough years of waking up in panic every day. Mm. Um, the resulting illnesses, because even though I'm from Canada, there's still health things you have to pay for uh, that I couldn't. Um, the worry, just taking on a new job because I got hired at the University of California, Riverside. Um, so new job, type of job I haven't, hadn't really done before full time, new country. Um, Oh, so much, and still having the 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 legacies of the the way my my body had deteriorated through those two years. So very, very, very different. Um, Can I stop you there for a second? Sure. What was the physical cost of those years of uncertainty? Sure, you one right here. Mm. Uh, I mean, she's pointing out a tooth that's missing. Yeah, I'm getting them fixed, but it, you know, there were a lot of them. They fell out, and not easily. It was painful. Um, I have fibromyalgia, so I have uh, soft tissue pain a lot. Um, some of it idiopathic, it just doesn't, it comes out to, they don't really know where it comes from. I have um, ADHD, I have nonverbal learning disorder. Um, and I was so anemic, I didn't realize it. I was so anemic, I could not think through a sentence. I couldn't read a sentence, much less write one. And I, because of the ADHD and the fibro, that can cause brain fog anyway. I didn't realize something was wrong. Uh, I thought I was just having a bad week, month, year, you know, and I kept trying to push myself to do the writing that would have gotten us out of the financial um, morass. And when you say the right thing, looking back on it now, what would the right thing have been? I believe that you said that the anemia um, was causing a brain fog such that when you were under financial emergency, you could not, you could not think of the right thing. Were you saying the right things to do, or are you saying you were having a hard time thinking of your writing? Did I, I was having a, I was having a hard time writing because okay. uh, I couldn't concentrate. I would literally, there's a, a a simple meditation I sometimes do that's counting to ten and back down and ten and back down. I could not get to ten. Mm -hmm. before I would lose track. Wow. And yeah, I'd that's, keep that's serious. Track. No yeah. focus. But it would sound as if stress by itself had become sufficient strain to ex explain a lot of what was going on there. Not all of it, of course. Not all but of that's it. That's very real. Yeah, not all of it. I mean, the anemia was caused by physical stuff um, that... Uh, meant I didn't have but you know I didn't have no red, red blood cells to rub together. What, and it, was your diet uh, I, less than optimal? My diet was less than optical, optimal because I couldn't afford yes. the food. Exactly. Um, I have uh, that thing that a lot of black women do, uh, fibroids. And so mm -hmm. that causes excessive bleeding. That means that you're anemic and yes. we have gotten out of control. Been there, done that. <laughs> yep. Holy cow. Yep. Holy and cow. I, didn't, I didn't realize, I guess because of brain fog, because I, I know the symptoms. Um, and I didn't realize that something was wrong um, until I went to a doctor for something else entirely and she ordered a blood test and then called me up and said, get to your primary physician now. <laughs> Mm. Um, and my primary doctor was on the verge of, of hospitalizing me because my blood count was so low. Wow. Um, I got really creative about getting food into us. I cook a lot, but if you can't afford the food, there's nothing to cook. Right. Um, if you're homeless, it's hard to have the facilities to cook, even if you've got the food. Yep. I knew where there were, you know, wild plants growing that in a pinch we could cook. It's a city, so you're not too sure where those plants have been, but I knew where they were. Or what's um, been on those plants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could take a, a leek and I would save the bottom part and grow it back. So I could turn one leek, it might take me you know, weeks to save up for that one leek. They're not, they're not cheap. Um, but I would dig, a, dig some earth, put it in a cup and keep growing that one back. I got really, really creative about keep, 
acting as fed and um, people close to me would joke that I was making stone soup. Right. Mm. <laughs> Let me ask you this, because, you know, all of us have struggles and periods where you feel like you're just in a tunnel and, and no clue what's on the other side or if there's another side. How did you maintain your hope and faith during this period? Or were you just putting one foot in front of the other to get through the day by day without necessarily a feeling of hope, but just needing to survive? Mostly one foot in front of the other, mostly having really good community around me, people kept us alive during those two years. Um, people would bring food or they'd put us up for a week or a day or a month or a year. Um, just the, the, the sheer kindness that came out of writing community, science fiction community, queer community, family um, kept us going. And um, I will always, um, bear witness to that, to like just the sheer kindness that we received from people until I could start to hope again, because I, I, I didn't have any. I didn't have nothing left. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard place to come to. I mean, the, the structure of storytelling says that on the movement between any two levels, you're going to hit the dark night of the soul the moment where it feels like there's just nothing left. And we understand that in storytelling but it's hard for us to grasp when we're in it. Yeah. That, that there is any good, it's going to be anything on the other side of it. I'm so glad that people were reaching out to you, providing, you know, food and shelter, because that's as primal as it gets. When you have emotional connections with people providing with food and shelter, it's much easier to hope, to feel like, you know, maybe, maybe there is something on the other side. Yes. And I remember one friend, we sold our home took whatever money was left and sort of went on the road where people would put us up. And we got to one friend uh, in the UK and I don't know if she'd be comfortable with me sharing her name, so I won't. But she and her, her partner were gonna put us up for a couple of months. And we arrived at the airport, she picked us up and she handed us bus passes for three months. And being London, that meant there was so much you could do you could get places because we had been in a state where we couldn't get anywhere that we couldn't walk to because who could afford bus fare? Right. So a simple thing like it's not just food and shelter. It's the means to sort of get out and do something simple like go to a museum on a free day. Uh, um, that sort of began to creak the world open again. We had two friends who are themselves writers who knew I was on deadline uh, and, and uh, my main squeeze was ill. And they took it upon themselves every time they went to the grocery to show up at our door. And they said, we know you're on deadline. You don't need to be worrying about this right now. Till you get your book in, we got you. Oh. Mm. These are not wealthy people. I understand. Yeah. Often it isn't. But isn't you are wealthy to have such yes. people in your life. True. So much. You True. Know, one question I enjoy, I like to ask people, um, and I want to make sure I say this so that I don't forget it. If you could send a message back to the younger Nalo, that you know, is there anything you would tell your younger self that would help her? Maybe it's just a word of encouragement, or maybe it's a strategy or a tactic or anything. What would you say to your younger self that that you know that that you wish you could? Or you wish somebody had said to you back at age Y or X. Honestly, I would say you are not lazy. You have ADHD. <laughs> there you go. Something as simple as that. You recontextualized everything. There is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because uh, my brain works differently than you know the advice you get from most people, uh, and so you, it's easy with this kind of brain to keep thinking that you're doing it wrong, that you're mad, bad, lazy, sick. You know, well, you don't what's think. The, that, what's the kind of advice that you found useless? The kind of just do it advice. Got it. <laughs> I literally have a brain that can't do that. I understand. I mean, what sounds like, looks like procrastination is my brain revving until it, it, it um, manages to generate enough dopamine to get me going. You know, Octavia talked about something very similar in last week's podcast on the recording uh, that as a student, she was, you know, always last to turn in her assignments and she had to spend half the time sort of thinking about what she was going to write before she ever laid pen to paper. 
Who knew and then she and then she learned how to write with economy because of that because she knew she wouldn't have much time left so she would have to say everything she wanted to say as succinctly as possible yep i definitely do that i people ask about you know do you have any trunk stories you know you no know, if i write it it's gonna go out the door <laughs> i can't i don't have enough productivity to have stuff just hanging around unless it's stuff i've forgotten um after <laughs> there is that <laughs> After we were coming out of the really bad period, every so often I'd find a notebook because I lose my notebooks and it would have writing in it that could only be mine, but I have no memory of because I was writing under such stress. Uh, you know, it's so interesting that you come from an artistic family, so you actually had role models of possibility in terms of the arts, but you did not have that in terms of academia. That's almost exactly opposite to the, yeah. the, the typical issue that people have where you know getting a job in academia comes naturally to them but actually th thinking about getting out and expressing themselves with craft and skill and then being able to market it enough to be able to make enough money to put a roof over your head and food on the table that can seem like magic it's like i don't understand what that is there's no way for me to get there if you're not born rich you can't do it you have you have found yourself safe harbor, an academic environment where they appreciate your gifts and you can give to people. And hopefully, do you still have the energy to do your own writing? How's your writing been? Um, my writing has always been start and, start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. That has not changed. Um, what has changed is now I will negotiate contracts that say no you're not going to be writing during the the the, the teaching year um for longer pieces anyway oh that's uh, smart hello mm -hmm. i didn't know we could do that <laughs> no, it was an artist who told me he was like no don't even because you're busy i've been a teacher too i know you're busy um so i could at least try um but what i started doing a few months ago because i i am about to be on deadline with something and i was working on getting the first you know few pages down and it's a graphic novel so i'm working with artists so they're dependent on me um and it's not a form i have tons of experience in so i started setting the clock a couple of hours earlier every day and i didn't think that would work with my brain that that should be deadly <laughs> but it did it was working and i'm going to start it again uh in may once i'm done with the teaching and grading setting the clock a few hour, a couple of hours early waking up when nobody else is around um, I will spend half an hour, sometimes an hour, just kind of doing the stuff the ADHD brain does, getting distracted by Twitter, that kind of thing. But I know it's my time. So at some point, I'll start writing. And I was getting a fair bit done that way, um, very close to daily, which would probably be the first time in a long time. One question I wanted to ask you is, you, you mentioned that you have obligations to the artists. Mm -hmm. Some people, I would think that the more internal and external motivations you have, you know, the, 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 big, the bigger the fire under your butt that gets you going. But there are cases when that external motivation, the obligation to others actually paralyzes people. But it sounded as if it didn't hurt you. It was actually, you know, it's actually kind of nice in terms of productivity to feel like there's somebody else relying upon this. Is that true? That's part of it for sure. Um, and I had had the experience of working on, on monthly comics with artists before, and that was an extraordinary experience, uh, working on the, the uh, Sandman offshoot House of Whispers, um, where DC put together this amazing team of, of uh, artists, and they were amazing editors. So I had that experience of working with a team the two artists I'm working with um, have been doing this a crap ton longer than I have. So for me, it's like having mentors. Excellent. Yeah, so you it's... respond well to obligations to others and you respond well to wanting the approval of people you respect. And just asking for help, like learning to ask yes. for help. Yes. I think we have a lot of people have this sort of pride that they feel they have to be able to do it alone. It's overrated. <laughs> 
Well, you know, in the collaborative media, and this is something I want to get into because Steve and I are also, you know, making inroads into graphic novels. His graphic novel cover for Eightfold Path is the Eightfold Path is right behind him that he did with Dr. Charles Johnson, illustrated by Brian Christopher Moss. Got to get that plug in there. We also, Steve and I also have a graphic novel coming out in the fall, illustrated by Marco Finnegan called The Keeper, right? And, and this is a whole new world to, to me. And like television and film, it's a much more collaborative world. Like even remembering the illustrator is a co-author. He is not just, you know, someone you tag on. He's like an actual, so he, well, he the, has a part to the work. The artist is the director, the set director, yes. the set designer, <laughs> yes. special effects crew. Yeah. And then there are colorists and, you know, and all uh, kinds and, of And people. the editor, you know, the, yeah. the artist is really in control of so much of what you're doing. Uh, in that in that sense, how did you? What's did it been you like find, when you started working in the in the in the visual medium? To, in other words, the, how did you find that translation? Because I think that a lot of our listeners are looking at the fact that that graphic novels and podcasts have broken have, have increased the number of markets, while the first step to get in is still a lot lower than Hollywood. Yeah. You know, you don't. You know, it takes a lot more juice and a much stronger team to get into Hollywood. Graphic novels and podcasts are kind of down down here where you can you can you can reach them. So tell us a little bit about how it happened to help provide a ladder. You know, leave some breadcrumbs for the people just starting. How did you do it? Uh, and again, it's going to be atypical, but I knew I was interested in learning to write comics. So I started reading about writing comics. I started talking to people who work in comics. Um, I practiced in one or two of my own, but didn't get very far. But that interest didn't stop being there. Um, as to how I broke into it, that came as a result of being a writer with a bit of a name to herself. So DC contacted me, said, we're working on this. We're going to be rebooting the Sandman series. We have four new storylines. Um, would you like to pitch for one? And hey. one of yeah. So, no shame, and that's always great. So was the editor who reached out to you a fan, or did they perhaps have a conversation with one of the people that you talked to trying to gain information? Do you have any idea how your name came to their attention? I do. Neil Gaiman. Hello. <laughs> <Hello. laughs> In mean, fact, let's go on and we'll get Neil, a little Neil. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> says you miss Stephen King so <laughs> yes uh I know Neil um we've been been you know distant friends but friends for a while he knows my work and he knew that one of the, the uh, new characters that he had not exactly created but had written out a description of was um Elzuli, the the mm. Yoruba transplanted to uh, the, the West deity of uh, love. She's um, particularly solicitous of women, children, and queer people. She likes wealth. She likes grace. She likes, and I have written that character or similar characters, Yamaya, other deities from the, the Yoruba pantheon before. So um, Neil knew I could do it. So he probably told them to ask me, but I still had to pitch. It wasn't, here you go. <laughs> It was would you pitch? So it was a combination of creating work mm -hmm. and cultivating relationships. Yeah. So the work is out there representing who you are. You're also developing your skills and you're also creating the possibility of fans who will intersect with the people who can offer jobs. And simultaneously, you are asking questions of people who are in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and you're making friends with people like Neil Gaiman. I mean, on some level, you must realize that you must realize that making powerful friends never really hurts. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's just wow. Here's this person you respect who respects your work. It's just it's pure kid stuff on that level. That's the key part that it is kid stuff. That I'm not going out there saying, well, I need to make friends with X, Y, and Z. Oh and yeah, blah blah blah. It's it's. I go to the events, I run into people, I am eager to talk about what they do. Um, I'm eager to talk about what I do. I do it the way you would handle your social life. So there isn't some kind of arch plan because you can always hear when someone's doing that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and and when you look at them it's like they're not looking at you they're looking past you to that goal that they hope you're going to get them to um so you know, i found with that. that that there's a difference between meeting somebody who's famous powerful knowledgeable and trying to get them to introduce you to their contacts or give you a job and asking them questions so it's ask trying to you know tap into their wisdom i have found that if you're saying well how did you create this effect or how did you or the wow this was really wonderful how did you do that that people are very open to that they love talking about how clever they are <laughs> or how hard they work but they hate it when you're asking them to introduce you to other people the people yeah. that they know now yeah. you're trying to leapfrog over them or, or read say, this right away like here i just met you yes, will you read this right. book will you read this screenplay you know it's oh, no. <laughs> it's like you did it right in that sense yeah, I figure they don't they don't really care about that and it's not the right way to do it. No. So tell tell us about okay, so you got your first job and how did you approach it? What happened? Uh so I wrote the pitch. Um I had no idea how to write a pitch. No one is ever gonna see that pitch. It is probably not very good. Um eventually it took two years um before they actually got the project off the ground hmm. uh and they wrote me back and said are you still interested i'm like yeah did you like my pitch <laughs> i haven't even heard back what you thought uh and so i ended up doing this and um it was a learning curve from hell um the first two issues of the the story i rewrote eight times each what was the most difficult aspect of transitioning to to comics for you Thinking in terms of all the things that you're pulling together. I mean, you have to disabuse yourself as from as a prose writer, disabuse yourself of the notion that your precious words, the more there are of them, the better. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so I had already done a little bit of work in that direction. That wasn't so bad, but it's the the formatting that allows the script to be legible in such a way that you know what you're doing and the artists know what you're doing and the fact that there isn't any standard format for comics did you use what software did you use i tried a couple of things i tried scrivener i looked at um i think it's called first act or second final draft group. that's it <laughs> final draft that's a screenwriting program yeah 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 and it wasn't working i went right back to word okay right um and then did what you use I, a, a template or just straight word? I was doing straight word until I started co-writing um, with, with Dan Waters and he would send me his drafts and I don't know what he's using, but it, it templates it for you. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. And I think he is exporting from final draft. So that if I had just written caption and I'd written a caption, then the very next thing would be the next part that I needed to write right. and I'd think about it so you much. You just hit the tab and you get your character and you have, you know, it automatically formats dialogue and so forth yeah, and so yeah, on. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, Nalo, I know this is something that you had studied on your own and you were interested in it. And I often remember that one of the last correspondences I had with, with LA Banks, Leslie Banks, who wrote the Vampire Hunter series, was she was very excited about graphic novels and wanted me to get into it. But there was so much mystery around it. Uh, like with screenwriting, I didn't even know the formatting. It's all such a mystery in a fog bank. But then when you delve into it, what I find, especially since, you know, let's face it, we're all over 30 here, learning something new about writing at this age is a huge turn on to me. It just excites me. So even this podcast by extension is it excites me so much to learn new platforms and to learn editing and to so do you do you find that you know once you get over that hump of that horrible learning curve that it actually invigorates your imagination to enter a new genre like this, a new platform? It can do in that that tricksy way my brain does where at first it it it's overwhelmed and it's a big problem, and then you get an inspiration for something that you couldn't do it that way in prose. And so for a few pages, you're just like excited because you've just thought of this great new way to put together the story. Um, so it, it comes in fits and starts, like everything I do, I have to sort of remember- Can you give us an thing. example of something you felt like you could not do in prose that you were able to do in a graphic novel? Because I agree with you that that's the case, but I was just kind of wondering if you could give us an example. I can tell you something I learned about um, comics by listening to the artists, because when this was all starting up, of course, the media were very excited that new Sandman stories were coming. We were getting interviewed a lot. 
and it was Darren Bennett who um, was doing the the lettering. Grew up reading comics, thought of the lettering as the per the letterer as the person who puts the words on the page. You think it's you know not terribly exciting. Listening to him talk, I realized what he was doing was sound design, mm -hmm. and so that affected how I would notate the various sounds and the dialogue. I could I could move um, a, a speech bubble to a part of the story that would imply the distance between characters. I could wow. ask him to use a particular kind of font that would imply tone. Mm -hmm. um, and then he would take it even further. Uh, he would design the speech bubbles to, to, so that visual sense and that sense of actual movement, you can convey so much so quickly and so efficiently in, in comics. Uh, Have you ever read uh, Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics? I think yeah. that, that is one of the best books on art I have ever seen in my life. Yeah. yeah. But yes. it's specific to comics and it's just, it's wonderful. Yeah. No, you're, yeah. What you're saying about what you heard from the, from the letter, uh, I'm just thinking back on the old days when I read Marvel comic books obsessively and the letter is like Artie Simic um, and, and Stan Lee talking about how important it was. And I realized now that he was talking about things like you just said, only I never realized what I, I didn't, I never saw what you were just saying. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And just having him say it and listening to the, the people who did the coloring, how they could convey the quality of hardness of a surface Ooh. or the cultural, you know, milieu uh, of, of someplace by just how they used color. Um, really opened up how I wrote about and described stuff for them because essentially as a comics writer you are writing instructions to the artists about your vision and you're writing the dialogue. Everything else is theirs. Mm -hmm. And it's that's what was really exciting to me that I would send out this bunch of little black squiggly marks on you know phosphorus and what would come back would be this four-dimensional thing that moved and had I can talk to you about one particular image. Um, near the end of the series, there is, uh, I have a romance, two young people who have grown up in um, the, the prison camps at the US border for refugees and who have left the camps but are in very bad situations, each of them, and they find each other and they're falling in love and they have fallen asleep, they're sleeping rough, they've fallen asleep in the desert. And one of them has, trauma that she reenacts in a particular way and her new boyfriend wakes up in the middle of the night sees her disappearing realizes she's in trouble and he's going to go save her he uses a wheelchair so I had to find out how you get back into a wheelchair if you're lying on the ground and he did and I said all right now he's heading for her health leather he's going to go get her and the artist between them drew the single panel of this young man broken glasses, in a wheelchair, determined to go get his girlfriend and help her out. And everything in every single line and movement, and these are, there are, are one character's queer, one's trans. These are, and they're both people of color. And his movement is so dynamic. And they put these lines around it, the superhero lines of when, you know, somebody's going to you know, save the world or catch the plane or whatever it is around a young man in a wheelchair. And I right. into tears. There were no words in that panel. Everything I had, you know, spent a paragraph or two describing were all there. No words needed. Beautiful. And so much imagery that the heart longs to see if you belong to any of those affinity groups. Yes. Um, oof, so powerful. That is, that is amazing. And I love I, it. You know, one of the things I love about hearing you say that is that reinforces something that we heard from Brian Fuller, some things that we heard from Brian Fuller, the, the, the showrunner on American Gods, you know, Neil Gaiman again, it had to do <laughs> with creating visual images that we have not seen before, not seen used in that way before, which then allows you to mine new emotional territory. Yeah. You're uncovering some new stuff that hasn't been done before. And when you can do that in connection with something that people have a deep desire you know, to see, I think that you're you're not just you're not just appealing to those groups. When I watched the No Man's Land sequence in Wonder Woman, mm 
Mm. I sat there thinking to myself, I am so happy for my sisters. If I was a woman, I, I would fe be looking at this and thinking I didn't even know how much I needed to see yeah. this. Yeah. Because so, yeah, that's so you you're putting more thought into the visual images than you would into a specific visual image in your prose writing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you're also realizing that there are things that actions that we do that it is very difficult to describe in words. Uh, at one point, I wanted a character to do this kind of sort of thing, the, the whatever face. And I didn't know how to describe it for the art. <laughs> I finally took a picture of myself doing it and sent it. To <laughs> your, your fingers on a W is what she's yeah. doing if you're, yeah. if you're listening on audio. Yeah. If but, I had to do that in prose, you would not know what I was talking about. Right. See, I hear the fun. I hear the fun you've been having doing that. So that's great. And I agree. It's just, it's so exciting to, to stretch. Doesn't sound like struggle. Learn and grow in those ways. You know, you, you've talked about like the difference between now and 10 years ago. And now it's looking pretty great. But in between yeah. then and now, we had a couple years of pandemic. So I would like to talk to you about COVID, post-COVID and coping in general as an artist, as a person. What has helped you cope? And do you have practices you have continued uh, in the past couple of years that help you cope and stay centered and be your best self? Mm. Um, therapy helped. As, and yeah. again, I was in a place where I could afford it. Um, and I was able to find somebody who, you know, had a lived understanding of a lot of the things I deal with. Um, and uh, as somebody Black, as somebody Caribbean, you have a lot of resistance to therapy. Mm. Um, but this was somebody whose professional job it was to be able to understand what I was doing and who was a sounding board. That's. Um, I love my therapist, so I'm, I co-sign you completely on that one. Yeah, totally. Um, again, having good relationships, and I know not everybody has that luxury. Yes but where you can cultivate those. Because um, I found that being a writer, the first thing that started happening and is probably happening to you folks too, is people all of a sudden wanted more content. They wanted you to be talking about, you know, how do, what's gonna happen when this is all over? We want hopeful writing. And you're like, I'm in it. I can't even go outdoors. What do you mean hopeful writing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, N.K. Jemison talked about, you know, how she's trying to write a sort of a light novel right now, but the times are not light. So there's a big mismatch happening. There is. So I end, actually ended up writing more because some of those projects were actually really inspiring. There was one by um, Joe Walton, writer Joe Walton was one of the leads and a librarian and another writer where they were doing a fundraiser for an Italian organization that was basically helping uh, refugees and women through COVID. And Joe said, well, we're basing it in the Decameron. And I did not, I have not read the Decameron. And she said it was written during the plague, during the Black Death. And it's about a bunch of people who are sheltering in place, waiting for death to come get them. And they're each telling stories as they're waiting. So we're doing something that's modeled on that. And that just mm. caught my fancy. And that story happened fairly quickly for me because it was just like, oh, what an amazing, like it's a reach back a few centuries to something that's not really that different than what we're going through now that feels so new. Uh, and just the whole conceit in that positive way we use conceit around it really excited me. Um, so I ended up doing more writing. I ended up turning projects down because I wasn't there for the let's pretend this is all over, you know, everything's like, I'm like, all right, Black Lives Matters, just happening, COVID's happening, can we talk about the current moment, mm -hmm. rather than, oh, this is going to be better soon, because no, I'm a science fiction writer, I know that this is changing the world forever. <laughs> um, and I had to, a lot of my peers were just too discouraged to write, and I wanted to let people know that was okay, that that was a perfectly sensible response to what's happening around us and it's still happening. Um, yeah, maybe this is a good time to take up gardening, you know, for some people or... or... See my balcony. 
I don't even know if I can make that shit grow, but it's, it's up there in box. Gardening for many years. If you knew ahead of time that, let's say, a year from now or two years from now, you're going to hit another emotional downturn if you're not careful. If you mm. knew that it was coming, you know, I think that to a certain degree, we need to, you know, we need to be realistic about the fact that we're going to get hit with enough stuff that we're not going to be able to handle it well. What would you put into place now? Would you just make sure that you were seeing your therapist twice a week as opposed to once a week? Or would you do other things? What would you do to, to stress proof yourself if you knew it was coming? I would do that. I would do the sort of physical stuff I'm starting to get back into, um, but having to do differently because older body now has arthritis. Um, I would do the caretaking things, the things I can do to take care of self that then extend to taking care of others. For instance? Um, there's so much. I make other things. I would be doing more of that. Yeah, I make arts and crafts. Yeah, she's sculptures. I cook. I sew. I whatever comes to hand. Because my mother was that kind of maker. She would take on a new skill because yes. she was curious about it. And so I've, I've learned that from her. I would give that privilege may, um, more with, than I'm doing now. With all due respect and affection, mm -hmm. may I suggest that you have that privilege. I do. You have that privilege right now. And, you know, I bet everyone who loves you, if you were said, would you please look in my eyes and tell me that I have that privilege, they would all be happy to do that. If you need permission from outside you, consider that Tanana Reeve and I are giving you our, our little tiny fraction of there that, that when that stress inevitably hits, you can come through it, it ignites your creativity, and you can inspire younger writers who are now on that place if they don't ever see how they're going to get to a place of accomplishment and safety like you they however many however many problems and issues you're dealing with your life is a dream for some writer out there who sees no way to get the acknowledgement or even being published yeah. so we're all at that place right now where we can provide inspiration to those who believe that there is no hope yes and that is definitely something i try to do in my own small way when my patience and focus allow because I hear so many budding creatives who believe the stuff that that's in the air that tells them they can't do this they aren't worthy they're too old I mean who at 26 is too old to do anything right too old <laughs> is the biggest lie ever told yeah it is yeah. it is you uh, know one of the reasons why you know our our pedagogy you know, the, the life writing, the application of Joseph Campbell's model of the hero's journey to to structure as well as process and as well as life starts with write. If you're willing to commit to writing one sentence a day, every day, just one sentence a day, you're starting to get the rock moving. Just, you know, if, just if you'll make that commitment, we can give you the strength. You can give, we can give you the way to leverage that effort to produce more and more and be more and more happy. But I think that all three of us here, you know, have been through that thing of, you know, is it, does it make any difference? You know, I was at the deathbed of one of the most honored writers in American science fiction history. And this person was asking, you know, did not know, did their work make any difference? Mm. Would anybody remember them? You know, does, mm. does, does any of it matter at all? In other words, the level of accomplishment does not matter. It doesn't matter. Those voices are in our heads because they're in our heads. And we have to protect ourselves from them yeah. or enlist them in the process or else we're never going to be able to give our gift to the world, the gift of our light to the world. I'm so glad mm -hmm. that you have been able to make it through that and that you're in a place of safety. Yes. And, and also, and contribution, continued contribution. One of the things I love about the arts which is also one of the frustrating things about the arts is that when you release it into the world, you don't know where it's going to land. And it rarely lands where you want it to land, which is like a full page ad in the New York Times <laughs> or, or, or the bestseller list or whatever dreams you have. But it lands in the hand of a teenager, someone who's imprisoned, 
-hmm. a teacher, right? Someone who lights up at that image you just described of your character in a wheelchair being a superhero, right? Just like in, in their quest and you have no idea you've yeah. touched this person. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. And incredible. one of the things I try to do too is also speak against the, the, the idea that you're some kind of machine. I mean, Steve, you and I both talk about try for a sentence a day. Ask me how often I've been able to do that. Very, very, very rarely. Yes. But it's there as a guideline for me for the fact that I do not have to churn out 2,000 words a day. No. In <laughs> actuality, it is not saying that if you can't do a, wor a sentence a day, you can't be a writer. What it says is that if you're not doing a sentence a day, what stops you is not a matter of logic and external circumstance. There's something going on emotionally, spiritually inside you. And you. It, this is a time for a therapist, for meditation, for yeah. circling with your friends. It is as much a diagnostic yeah. as it is a strategy. Absolutely. Or look That's, at, you, I mean, know, I don't, you know, I don't want anybody to use that to, to trigger guilt. Or where is that shame. hour? How can I choose to repurpose a certain hour of the day that I might use for writing that right now I'm using for not writing, you know, or whatever it is. But I love that as a diagnostic. It's been yeah. very, very helpful for and me. And like you, I don't always get there either now. <laughs> people go into don't. guilt, blame, and shame and needy, wounded, abandoned child stuff because they can't get that sense. In other words, they will use that to beat themselves up, which once again is you know, it, when I was coaching writers, I said, well, write down what comes up for you when you missed several days. And it's just, it's filth. It's just all the stuff they heard from their parents and society and, you know, rejection letters and cruel readers and just, it's awful stuff that they're carrying around. And it's like, that's, that's what you have to deal with in order to get for, you have to turn that bullshit into fertilizer. Yeah. You have to find <laughs> some way to get clear some way so that's that's your work right there but the needy the the shame and the guilt and the fear that is what kills dreams it doesn't help <laughs> creativity nobody is more creative under those circumstances that's correct no that's correct. absolutely not and I, you know what we've tried to do in the, the life writing premium program transitioning to the advertising part of the <laughs> sponsor <laughs> we're you know, truth in advertising is to create a program where every week we're giving offering prompts and videos and lectures and telling as much truth as we can about what this process is not just the technical but the emotional and the practical sides of it if they can give us one sentence a day and watching one little video a week that's that's their minimum and then we we allow them to go more deeply if they can but it is because of conversations with people like you and like octavia that it, the course is filled with wisdom gathered in these kinds of conversations, kitchen table conversations, where we're just sitting around dropping the bullshit and talking about what is this thing called art and what is this thing called writing and how how the hell can we survive? And how do you navigate an artist's life? You know, the part of us that wants to dream at the piano while the lights are going off and reconciling that with the part, at least for me, I cannot create in a state of terror, you know, and, and instability. So how do we What's balance a, how that? How bad is it if you have to create to make money and if you don't have money, you're in terror. So you've got a negative cycle there. You need to create in order to get the money you need to, 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 <laughs> to pay for the things. But I can't do that because the fear of not being able to do those things is freezing me. How do you break out of that cycle? But there are ways to do it, but those ways are not generally taught in MFA programs. You know, they're, they're found in psychology, they're found in martial arts, in yoga, and meditation, in Buddhism, and Taoism, in all sorts of different shamanic traditions. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when the ability to create is connected to the ability to survive. So that's kind of my, my approach is what can allow people to survive this artistic life. And, you know, I, we hope that people go over to lifewritingpremium.com take a look at what we've got there. And if it looks like something that would be of use to you, please, you know, just, you know, ch check it out. We have monthly hot seats where we actually, you know, we don't have the time to, to edit people's stuff anymore or coach individuals anymore, 
but every month we can take a couple of stories from our group and analyze them, you know, on Zoom and let you listen. How do we think about this? Right. Uh, and it's not that we want you to think about it the way we think about it, but we want you to think about it in some way that is as clear to you as our met way of looking at it is is to us. So that's, you know, that's yeah. the spiel for that. Life Check writing it out, www.lifewritingpremium.com. And Nalo, is there, first, is there anything you want to plug in terms of something coming that's out? Right. How can people find you? And how can we other people find, oh, here comes the book cover. No? What? No, 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 not oh, yet. Okay. God knows I have to, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought I saw a book oh. cover coming. But, <laughs> but um, I want to go back really quickly, though, to Steve's question about what would you do to prepare? And, sure. Uh, I go back to community. What got me through finishing the novel I started in those bad years and couldn't finish and had to give the money back and all of that was somebody said to me, a group of us are getting together every day on Zoom and we write, we hang out for a bit and we write for three hours. And uh, they were academics, they were writers, uh, more or less at the same uh, level of where they were in their careers as, as me. Um, and that was what got me through going back to this novel that I was, it was hard to look at because I'd had to find all that money to repay because it had been 15 years and it was mm. community that helped me finish that novel, which I have just signed a contract for. So Yay. thank goodness for that community. I want to, you know, Congratulations. Real, real applause for but that. Remember you earned your way into that community. You know, they, you have to earn your way into a heart space. You can't pay your way there. Yeah. So these are people who love you and support you and see your fire. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and we did that for each other. So it's, it's, it's a lovely thing. Yes. Beautiful. I'm not sure there's a better thing in terms of the arts because the arts can be so lonely. Yes. Especially for writers. Ooh, okay. Well, that is fantastic. Nalo, I am so happy for you just overall. Happy to see you. You look fantastic. Happy to listen to you. Happy you were able to be on this podcast. Thank you just so much for being here. And where can people find you and find out more about you? All right, the applause. Yeah, so applause is a bit late. Yeah, where can people find you? All right, where you want to be found. <laughs> I'm at nalohopkinson.com, so I have my website. I Great. am on Twitter at nalohop1. Nalohop1, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Either one of those will get to me. If you want to invite me to come and speak and there's some money behind it, you can contact uh, booksincommon.org. Y'all heard that last part, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's give Nalo some speaking Everybody. gigs, people. There you go. There yeah. you go. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on the Life Writing Podcast. We wish you all the best with everything you do in the future. And for those of you who are, who are listening, starting with a sentence a day, go out and, and make yourself the hero or heroine of your own story. And right. just remember, it's your life. It's your story. Tell it your way. All right, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.